a lot of you guys have been going through tests in the home. There's been exams, um, lots of GCSEs, A-levels, people at university trying to get the last dissertations in and trying to get through to the last um, essays and get completed. And the tests, you might have had lots of little tests to get through for this big day for a big test. It's a lot of pressure. Maybe the house is under a lot of pressure because you're thinking, oh my goodness, trying to keep everybody just in peaceful living. Well, we all go through tests and all different seasons, and it's a season for a test. Thankfully, you'll be glad to know you don't live in that test every single day. But all the knowledge that you've acquired, everything that's been input from the book knowledge into the theory into your head, the whole test, as we know, is to say, can you actually practice? Do you understand what have you been taught? You know, God tests us. And we often don't like that. We don't want to be tested, do we? But God tells us he tests us not to pull us down, but to, to pull us up. He tests us because what he's saying is, is all the knowledge that you've required, all the preaching, all your reading of notes, all your devotions, this is the time to put it into action. You know, often we sometimes get, oh, but I'm being tempted. Well, remember, temptation is not from God. Temptation is from the devil. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, that you'll never be, be tempted beyond what you can bear. God will provide a way out. So where Satan's there to pull you down, God's there to pull you up. He's wanting you to believe in yourself because he's parted everything. You know it all. And so many times in my life, I've maybe not passed a test. But God in his grace and mercy gives me another try and another chance. So you might be going through a test or maybe you've been through a test. But what's really lovely to know is it's just for a season. Testing is not forever. It's a season to take us up to the next level. There's no point in going into the next level at school if you don't understand the last level. No point in going to the next level at university if you haven't got a full foundation of this level. And if there's areas you need to polish up, it's highlighting that, whew, got through that by the skin of my teeth. And I've many a times done that. But what it's highlighting is saying, maybe I just need to readdress some of them things that I thought I was stronger on. What is um, great about the testing is that as you go up the levels, you think that you've passed and you don't have to redo them levels again. Well, maybe you don't, but it's on a different level. And a different level is for you to realize that what you do know and what you do put into practice that you can keep trusting God. It's trusting him through the whole process, not a little bit of it. Can you imagine if the test was put in front of me today and I sat down and thought, oh no, it doesn't really matter. Of course it matters, that's what the whole process is for. You're there, you might as well see it to the end. Trusting God all the way. Often people give up on the process. When we're just singing that song, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't understand it, you're working. You never stop. Do you really believe that today? And if you just stay with me for a couple of minutes, I'm going to share just two of my testimonies. And you know what a testimony is? You've been through the test. So now you can able to express and to um, rejoice in it. These are two testimonies from a long time ago. And I mean, lots of us go through daily tests and there's been lots of testimonies since then. But the reason I want to share these particular testimonies is because I can stand where I am today by the grace of God because of passing that test. Because of what God put into me and that I saw through even when I was holding on, thinking, oh my goodness, Lord, if you don't break through now... I don't know what's going to happen. But because I saw that and I felt encouraged and found the strength of that, because I could go on to the next level, then we stood in a building where we're at today because I learned them principles back then. So uh, behind me, you can see in that picture, this is the Bible college I went to. I was about 19, 20-year-old. Uh, only yesterday, I know. 
And um, uh, when I was there, I met Jonathan and Bridal College. And um, Jonathan was, at this point, he was in his first pastorate. And the thing that was really amazing about um, me being there more than anything, he said, if you lived in different areas, obviously you had fees to pay, as all you students know. And if you lived in different areas, um, then, it's a long time ago, thankfully it's not like that now, um, certain areas wouldn't give you a grant. And the area that I lived in, unfortunately, wouldn't give me a grant because it was a Bible college. So, but God made it very clear for me to go, and, but I went with the understanding that I wouldn't advertise this. If God took me, even when I don't see him working, he'll see me through. And I will trust him through it all. Now, that sounds great. You can throw that out. And this testimony is a lovely testimony to tell you. And, it's a, and I pray that he encourages you today. But the thing is, is when you're going through every day, when you're going through that you've got your board, you've got your food, you've got your lodgings to pay for, you've got your tuition, you have to pray every book in, every stationary uh, resource in, any transport thing you had to pay in. Then believe it or not, young people, you might find it's hard to believe, but there was no internet. We had to write all our essays. So you had to pay, pray all them things in, every stamp you had to pay in, every telephone call, there was no such thing as mobiles. You needed money to phone home just to make sure you were still alive and kicking. All them things, with lots of tests in the week, in the month, within the year. But these are a couple of larger tests that I really come to in my life. And the miracles were flowing, but this was a, a crunch point for me. I don't know if you can see, but just behind that tree, there's a little door that's open, and that was the principal's office. And um, I knew the principal's office quite well, but that's for another story for another day. I was only young, so um, have grace on me, please. But um, I was uh, sat down there one day, and um, the principal, I was really quite frightened. He was a godly, good, really good man, a um, little bit of the old school. And I was sat in there in this lovely big room. You can imagine like Dalton Abbey, isn't it? You know? So I was sat down there, big old fireplace and everything, shivering. God, oh my goodness, what's he going to say? And he says, Catherine, everybody called me Catherine, you know that you're in trouble. Catherine, um, he said, we're coming to the end of the year. You've tried hard, you've done well, blah, 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 all the rest of it. God's been amazing. But you know what I'm going to say? And I went, mm -hmm, maybe. The students are breaking up for summer and everyone's going home, but you've got a whole term's fees still outstanding. I went, oh, really? Of course I knew that, but what can I do? So I said, all right. He says, well, how are you going to suggest you're going to pay this off? I said, well, what do you suggest? I'm doing everything I can. I'm trusting God. I know he's going to break through. And so he says, well, we employ a few students through the summer period because they have lots of camps and things that are going on. And um, would you like us to employ you through the summer? Yes, that'll be awesome. I worked my socks off through the summer. I was there from six in the morning till 10 at night. I know all well, the students were having a, a lovely, relaxful time, but I gave it everything. See, God doesn't expect you to, to kind of um, not play your part. You've got your part to play. And while you provided this, I worked. I, we were, from when they were doing conferencing to um, all the rooms and the linen and the, the washing and serving meals. It was from like six in the morning till 10 at night. I worked the whole lot. And I was so excited. I thank God every day for that. We got through this. And um, when we got through to the end of this, halfway through, a few weeks to go, he called me back in to that room. You can see I'm quite traumatic, this room for me. And I thought, oh, he says, I just want to say, you've been outstanding. You've done amazing. You're on your last week. You have managed to pay this whole term's fees. Oh, yes. Get in. God is good. I did my part. God did his part. I kept on trusting. You keep on trusting and God will break through. If I do my part, if there's nothing else I can do, God will provide his part. And I strongly believe that. The thing is, is I believe that God was telling me to do another year. I shared with Jonathan and Jonathan was in his pastorate and he said, Catherine, I really could do you with me on the first pastorate. And 
you're not going to get any grant, and that's going to even put more financial pressure. And I said, I know everything that you say is right, and it doesn't make sense, but I know God's telling me to do another year. So I sat in there, and as I was sat there, and we went through, well done, you've got to the end of the term. I said, Mr. Petz, would you take me on for another year? He says, well, you know the rules, Catherine, that the rules are you have to pay up front. I said, yes, I know. He said, we have only a few weeks left. Yes, I know, but we have a few weeks left. He says, okay. He said, you bring your terms fees, a whole terms fees up front. It's a lot of money. He said, we'll take you on for the next year. That was great. You put my name down. I'm coming. I walked out of there across that green, walked like this. I got to my bedroom thinking, oh, what have I said? But we'll do this. I'll do my part. God will do his part. We still had a couple of weeks, finished the conference, kept on going, kept on working. We used to have a thing called, young people might find this a bit un unusual, but we had a thing called telephone boxes. And in the college, there was five telephone boxes. I know, to make contact, can you believe this? Every time you wanted to, you'd probably have to queue for about an hour outside each telephone box to um, phone home. And if anybody wanted to contact you, the telephone would go, or you would randomly pick it up to a stranger. Hello, can I speak to Catherine? Wait one minute. They would run around this massive com complex, it was a lot bigger than that, trying to find you, saying, your mom's on the phone, and then you would have to go and take the phone. Well, there was no students around, because there was only me and a couple of people that were around, and so my mom had been trying to phone, unknown to me, because I was working, and um, one of the visitors, one of the pastors that was walking past, who'd been at a conference, heard the phone, and just randomly, hello, I said, oh, I'm wanting to speak to Catherine. So he come down to the kitchen and says, has anybody called Catherine, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, your mum's on the phone. So I went, oh. So I went upstairs and I thought, oh, she, I've not shared any of this story. I don't want to worry her. She's probably thinking, why have you not phoned this week? If I didn't phone, it wasn't a good sign. But I thought she might detect in my voice as a bit of a problem. So, huh, hi, mum. She says, oh, I've been trying to get hold of you. I said, oh, I'm sorry, but it's really busy at the moment, which was true. She says, um, do you remember um, the Prudential? Now, some of you, again, sorry to educate, but some people in the room will know what I'm talking about. So often in families' lives, they would take out a little insurance uh, with the family, with the children, to um, help you how to save. So just put your 50 pence away a week, each week. Um, and this, believe it or not, there would be a man that would come to your house probably once a month, would sit down, have a cup of tea, you got rid of community, and they would sign a little book, and it would just kind of exchange like this, and it would just start like a little saving bank. When I started working, I'd maybe put a pound or a couple of pound each month in it. It was no big deal. But of course, it'd been unfrozen, the idea that at a certain point in your life, you'd be able to maybe put it towards some saving or towards a, um, a deposit for a house or something, if it ever reached that much. The Prudential man's been here. I went, ah. Oh thinking, oh, please don't ask me. He wants money as well. There's no chance. So I went, oh, really? She goes, yes, he's, he's retiring. And he just before he wants to pass your details over, he wants you to know, would you like to surrender what you've got there, or would you like him to pass it over? Well, of course, I wanted him to surrender it right there and that second. And he says, well, okay. I said, mom, surrender it. Get the check. Get it sorted. Let's go for it. How much is it? It was exactly to the penny to what I needed for the next term's fees. Now, these are just testimonies, and I can reel them off. And you think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But where you trust, you do your best, God will provide. The very last testimony, I was back in that room. I was sat in, it was my graduation was coming up. We're at the end of the Bible college now. And this lovely man of God sat me down and says, we know why we're back here, don't we? And I says, yes, but you've got to hear the miracle after miracle after miracle, what's happened, how God's provided. He goes, that's great. But the rule's the rule. And amazing as it is, you've paid three quarters of all the fees. That is outstanding. Everything had been prayed through. Nobody even knew. Even my friends didn't know that I hadn't got a grant. 
But he says, there's still for this last quarter to pay. I said, I know, but I'm doing everything I can. And he says, well, that's good. You do everything you can, and God will do everything he can. But the rule is the rule that if you do not pay up before graduation day, you cannot graduate. I know. So let's fast track. Graduation day comes. It's a big, big day for this college. They've got a marquee. They have every minister, every church is invited. It's a big celebration to show the college what they can do. They have, we have different workshops everywhere, um, dramas and music, showing your lecture rooms. And it's, it's the big showcase of the day. Jonathan comes all dressed up for the day and said, Kath, is it paid? No. Well, what are you doing? I am dressed for the graduation. I am dressed for the day. And I am holding my head up high and I'm saying, I'm doing everything I can do. God will provide the rest. My family start to turn up and a lot of my family, most of my family are not Christians, start giving you gifts and cards and congratulations, well done. Thank you. The clock is ticking. The day has arrived. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, if you're going to break through, please break through now. I really need you now. Everywhere I was going, I kept seeing the bursar. It was packed. And every time I get seen the bursar walking, I kept looking at him and going, no. Okay, okay. Two hours before I was going to be officially graduating, I could see the bursar walking up. And I could see, and I'm looking, I could see the smile. And I'm looking at him, and he nodded. He said, it's done. I says, how, where, who, what? He said, I don't know. It's an anonymous person, but it's done. Get my name on that list. People didn't know what was going on, but because I was so excited, because I did what God called me to do. I did my best. I trusted him. And through this test, it wasn't easy, I can assure you. It's great. It's easy to tell testimonies now. But at the time, there will be times that I would go, go into the toilet and start crying and thinking, what am I doing? Then grab yourself. Come on. Come on. Come on. Believe. Believe. Get back on. I felt about it. Peter, you stepped out of the boat. You saw Jesus. You were confident. You looked down. You thought, oh my goodness. And then refocus, refocus. What I'm saying and what I want to encourage you today is that if you do your part, God will do his part. If you turn with me to Abraham, Abraham chapter 22, God tested him. And let me just read this story to you. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Morai. Go and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He got up early because he didn't want to tell Sarah what he was doing. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. And then he chopped the wood for the fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there and then we will both come right back. So Abraham placed the wood on the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. And while himself carried on the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, uh, yes, my son Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said. I think he's probably about an, a teenager now, Isaac. But where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord, talk about last minute, the angel of the Lord from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes. Abraham thought, finally, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me, even your son, 
your only son. When Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket, so he took the ram, sacrificed it into the burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, as a testimony, to this day, people still name that as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It is amazing that seasons come and go. Abraham was being tested. It was a big test. It was what he would have never wanted to be there, but yet he remained faithful to the end. God will provide. A season is a set time. It's not just going to go on forever. You do your part and God will do his. I don't know what season you're going through. Maybe if you're going for a testing at the moment, maybe with your marriage, maybe with your finances, maybe with a bereavement or addiction, maybe your plans for the future. Maybe it's a test that's going on right now. If I can encourage you today is to put the basic principles into place. You do your part and God will do his. There's no point in not putting principles into place and not acting on the word of God and then expecting God to break through. No point in not having your time with God and not reading your Bible, but saying, oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a miracle. God, God, you know what I feel. You've got to do your part. Abraham, an amazing father of fathers. And yet there's quite a lot of parallels with this story. If you think Isaac, he was the miracle birth. He, he was given birth. He was a promise. And yet it wasn't till Abraham was 100 and Sarah's wife was 90. Can you imagine that? But they had the miracle birth. There was many a time that they've made mess. There was tests before and it's another story. But he went off with the second wife, Hagar, and gave birth. And there was always problems. And there still is to this day because he did it in his own way. If you do things in your own way, there will be repercussions from that. But if you keep, the promise of God will be fulfilled. Isaac was a miracle birth, the miracle that was fulfilled. So was Jesus, a parallel, a type. Jesus was the miracle birth, born from a virgin. Isaac traveled three days with his father up the mountain. Jesus traveled three days to the cross. Isaac carried the wood up the mountain for the burnt offering. Jesus carried the cross because he knew he was the offering. The ram with Isaac was caught in thorns. Jesus wore the thorns on his head. The ram up Mount Morah was sacrificed in place of Isaac. And Jesus, who's called the Lamb of the world, is sacrificed in place of us. What test what season are you going through? If you're not, then what principles are you putting in place to ensure that you're strengthening your core for when that test comes? You know, we moved um, house a few years ago, and in 2019, we have a lovely fruit tree, a plum tree in our back garden. We have done nothing with this, and yet we have reaped it from our amazing Bruce here. And it was, I've never seen anything like it. I thought there'd be a couple of plums, but I don't know if you can quite see from the picture. This was absolutely booming. It was blooming and I took, um, there was many, many of like buckets of plums just from this one, quite a small tree. I was so excited about this. I was really getting quite excited about the next year. Didn't prune it, didn't do anything with it. We were on with other jobs at the time, didn't give it any attention. And the next year wasn't quite as mm, a crop that I expected. But it was okay. There was a, a few on there. And so that's good. At least I got some plums on there. But when I actually got there, unfortunately, the wasps had got there before me. And so what had happened, they'd eaten the plums from the inside out. So from the outside, they looked great. But on the inside, it was just full of insects. 
Sometimes our Christian lives can look like that. From the outside, we can look the real deal. But on the inside, we've let something just eat us away. So this was a season in our life, in our family life, for pruning. We had to prune this tree. And the main reason being because the next year we had a disease. It was full of flies. It was full of um, like pigmented, all the, uh, the leaves. And I thought, what has happened? Got some advice and they said, yeah, you've got a disease. And there's a slight chance you could still survive the trees. A slight chance, but there's only one chance. You need to cut it all the way back. You need to prune it right back to basics. And that's what we did. We cut it right back and this year we can see the produce of the fruit is coming. And it's even going to be a bigger crop than it was before. Which amazed me. And it took me back to John chapter 15. And we're just going to read that together. John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. The vine and the branches. I am the vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Let's not be cut off, guys. If you're not bearing fruit, it makes it very clear what's going to happen. But while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Ouch. So that it will be bare, that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be disciples. It's an oxymoron, isn't it? It's, you do well, you produce fruit, and God's going to prune you away. You think, what? That's a, ooh, that's a bit sore. Ooh, cut it. Ooh, why, why are you doing that? Because he knows the potential in you. He knows there's going to be more yet to come. But pruning's only for a certain season at a certain time. It is not all the time. It is one season. The test is one season. Life runs in season. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 tells us that there are seasons all the time. There's a season for everything. I wonder what season are you in right now? Because there's one thing for sure, you might not be in a pruning season, but it will come. Just like winter, autumn, summer, spring, there is a rule. It will come. Are you ready? Do you identify it? Do you know where you're going? This is my tree right now. It needs, well, that's when it would need in a little bit of pruning, but this is my tree right now. And I don't know if you can quite see, but the fruit is just absolutely, it's just even, it's heavy with the fruit. It's amazing, but it's not ripe yet. If I go and pick that, it's going to be bitter. We can't eat that. It's no good. Let's not pick. You can see the miracle unfolding, but let's not pick it till it's ready. You can maybe see some miracles unfolding in your life, but don't pick them too early. There is a time, there is a season that it's set by God in heaven. Sometimes I've heard people say that, um, oh yeah, I, I'm going through a season. But sometimes I've learned in life, it's maybe not a season, but it's a spiral. You see, as we heard that life is full of different seasons, but seasons are, are for a set time of period. They'll have a start and they will have an end. An exam has got a start and an end. It doesn't go on forever. But a spiral, a cycle, a patterns of what we've heard before, we've been having a series of the patterns. Is there a pattern that's going on in your life? That's not a season. Maybe it's a pattern that is not a good pattern. You see, we can... Go through a season that starts and we know we just got to keep on trusting God provide and that it will end as long as I'm doing my bit in between. 
But if you're going through a spiral, the way to, um, to question yourself is if you're going through maybe a financial tough time, that could be a season. That could be a season that you've been tested with your finances. That why I'm struggling, am I still being faithful to God? Am I still putting him first? Am I still tithing? Am I still giving? Am I still doing this? Am I still doing that? Am I still paying my, um, my bills in what I need to be doing? Uh, am I being wise and sensible? Am I, am I cutting down maybe some things that are a treat because it's a bit of a tough season? Am I cutting some things down? Am I I'm doing what I can do? Or if you're in that for five, six years, and it's just keeping on going, that's what I would call a spiral. That's a cycle. That's a pattern. That's not a season. That is something that you need to bring into control, bring back. That's maybe you might need some support, maybe go on a cap course or bring somebody around to help you with your finances. That's not a season. That is a spiral. Have you got some areas or some places in your life that are a little bit out of control, that are spiraling and just keeping on going. If you let God the Father, if you will let him prune you, if you say, okay, what you say, God, I'm here, I'm yours, here I am, use me. If you let him prune you, embrace the season, and you'll know that there is better to come. Often people will say, I'm waiting for God. But I've often found that you're not waiting for God. God's waiting for you. God's waiting for you to put the things into practice. What you know. The theory of what you know is to refresh and to restart and to keep on going. You see, I've got a work glove that's designed as a work glove. It's not, um, it's not for something smart. It's a, it's a work glove. It's a, something for the garden or doing maintenance. And maybe as it's been designed for work, if we can represent this maybe of our Christian life today. It doesn't matter how much I talk to it. It's not going to do anything. Yeah, you can see it's a work glove and it's designed and it's got everything all ready to go, but... It needs more than that. I know, maybe I could encourage it. Come on, it's nice to see you again. You're looking so clean today. Oh, wow. I I do love the little extra strength and stitching that you've put around you. It's nice to see you on Sunday and being in church. That was good. Come back again. Still can't do the work. I know what it does. Maybe I could send it on a course and... Maybe it's needing a bit more fellowship. Maybe it's needing a few more gloves around it. So we'll get you all in a bit more fellowship and a bit more going on. Maybe it needs a discipleship, a training. Come on, if you put your thumb and your finger together, they'll start to work. But we know that it needs the living hand to go into it. The living hand to fill every area it to reach its full potential. Our lives needs the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the living word of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to to use us. We're the glove. But if we can have the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come, fill my life. Use, use me. Work through me. Have your way. Let me do your work. Let me see your blessings, your miracles unfold. It's not my way, it's your way. I know that you're working behind the scenes. And even when I don't feel it, I know that you're working. Even when the test comes, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll help me to remain faithful. Remind me to put into practice the things I need to keep on. Remind me to be faithful and knowing that I keep on trusting, keep on believing. Because I know when I do my part... I know you'll do your part. What part today are you needing to do? What season are you going through? It will come and it will go. What test have you passed with flying colors? And what test, it'll come around again if you're needing to resit. But that's okay. 
because you'll be stronger the second time round. God, your heavenly Father, loves you. He wants the best for you. Seasons will come and seasons will go. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. Let us pray. If you need refilling today of the Holy Spirit, then open your arms to Jesus. What is dead, bring to life. Holy Spirit, fill us afresh today. That we will be full of your power, your purpose, that we'd live a life that you'll be pleased with. That we would not be people of excuses, but we're people of action. Holy Spirit, work through each one of us today, we pray. When you prune us, we will not complain. When you cut back, we will not shout why. When you take away, we'll say, blessed be your name. When you give, we pray that we will also give. That our cup will be always overflowing with your goodness and your mercy that will follow us all the days of our life. Holy Spirit, we know you have not finished with us. Help us not to finish with you. And we pray that every day as the miracles unfold, that will testify of your goodness, your power, and your mercy. That we'll keep on trusting, keep on believing, that we'll keep doing what we need to do because we know at the right time you will provide. And all God's people say, Amen.